All right, well, if we're going to talk about um, gastrointestinal conditions, we can't ignore reflux because, again, if you watch television and you see the ads for um, proton pump inhibitors, and, and I hate those ads. They make me so angry. I want to throw my shoe at the television set. It's the one thing that may make me cancel cable, all right, because they show these overweight people eating garbage, right? And so you take your purple pill, you go eat fried chicken, and woohoo, you feel fine. And it's just the worst message possible. I mean, it's good news about your bad habits if you're watching TV and looking for a way to keep eating fried chicken, but it's just a terrible message in general. All right, so gastroesophageal, gastroesophageal reflux disease. What happens here is the lower esophageal sphincter relaxes when we swallow food to allow it into the stomach and then closes. The GERD results when that sphincter opens and closes at the wrong times. And two primary causes, you can have some structural damage to the LES resulting from poor diet and the constipation that is a consequence of the poor diet. In some susceptible people, um, the LES can transiently relax in the presence of some food. So uh, there are food triggers for people, and we sometimes have to look beyond just the adoption of a plant-based diet and resolving GERD. Stomach acid and, then the, and other contents then come up into the esophagus, and that's what causes all that burning and pain. It's diagnosed mainly through symptoms and sometimes endoscopy, although endoscopy doesn't always confirm it. Um, increasingly, though, people are self-diagnosing and buying proton and pump inhibitors on their own. You can go to the uh, store and buy them without a prescription. And um, there, I just wrote a five-page article, and uh, one of my video clips this week was on proton pump inhibitors and the fact that they really don't reduce your risk of dying of esophageal cancer or developing it at all. And uh, they often induce a worsening condition. In other words, when people stop taking them, their acid production um, uh, increases uh, exponentially. And so we have to withdraw people from PPIs very carefully because they could be quite miserable after they've taken them for a while. So the complications of reflux, if you don't do something about it, can be serious. Mouth ulcers, pain in the mouth, loss of taste, sinusitis, earaches, asthma, cancer, erosion of tooth enamel. Erosion to the tooth enamel is permanent. Most people with GERD have erosion of tooth enamel. The worse the reflux, the worse the loss uh, of an animal. Um, obesity is a major cause. One of the reasons is the weight of additional fat on the stomach can weaken the sphincter. Poor diet, food sensitivities, and uh, real common ones are milk, uh, gluten, sugar, coffee, alcohol, fruit juices, onions, chocolate fat, and fermented foods. Now, most people can just convert to a plant-based diet, and they don't have to worry about other uh, triggers. <coughs> Excuse me. But um, if that doesn't completely solve the problem, then we start looking at these other potential triggers. Another problem is fast eating and not chewing food well. Um, we have gotten into eating fast in our country, first of all, because we don't take the time to eat. And the second thing is because we eat food while we're driving, we eat food while we're doing other things and just kind of inhale it, we miss the whole point. Um, don't even taste our food a lot of times. Um, one interesting thing that I'll share with you is that for some people who have, seem to have difficulty um, stopping binge eating and overeating and all that sort of thing, one of the things I tell them to do is I just want you to start when you go home. If this affects all of you, I think it'll help you, or any of you rather. Um, go home, and what I want you to do is I want you to uh, really slow down and eat as much as you want. Like if you want to eat all 12 donuts, you go ahead and do that, all right? But I want you to sit there and just eat the donuts and experience the eating of the donuts and chew them up really well and swallow them and just experience the joy of eating a dozen donuts. And you know what happens to people? They come back in and I'll say, how'd it go? They go, oh my gosh, that was awful. I mean, after I ate four, I couldn't stand it anymore. My stomach was hurting, you know, or they, uh, they'll say I'm so disgusted with myself. In other words, a lot of our really terrible eating habits result from mindlessness, just mindless chomping away on stuff and not paying any attention, and it's astounding what happens when you start becoming mindful about it. Another problem that can bring on reflux is liquids consumed with meals, and I'll tell you why that becomes a problem. Um, the first thing is that there's only so much room in the stomach, and in an attempt to eat enough food to, salary, to satisfy your calorie needs, if the stomach is full of liquid, then you end up eating too much or drinking and eating to collectively too much, and the stomach becomes distended, and that puts pressure on the esophageal sphincter. 
Uh, constipation is a factor in most cases. It pushes the stomach up into the, um, uh, uh, up and pushes pre puts pressure on the esoph esophageal sphincter. Dairy products are a major factor, mainly because dairy products are constipating, um, along with everything else. Have you noticed how many times we've talked about dairy products being bad for you up here? It's like a special class of bad animal food, right? Um, high fat intake. Uh, in fact, researchers infused saline or fat into the duodenum of patients, and fat increased the number of LES relaxations. relaxations. Saline did not. Uh, research shows that reflux will get worse during the three hours after eating a high-fat meal. In other words, what most people will tell you is that it persists. It's not just right after they eat. That's why they end up taking drugs, because it doesn't go away right away. Most people can stand to be uncomfortable for a few minutes, but they can't stand it for three or four hours. Overeating, even without liquid, can um, the tension of the stomach stretches the sphincter until it's pulled open, allowing gases and acid up into the esophagus. Um, researchers inflated balloons in the stomachs of subjects, and in, that increased the number of relaxations. So it doesn't have to be full of food; it just has to be full in order to um, cause that to uh, uh, to uh, be weakened. The pain is more frequent for smokers and those who drink coffee after meals. Um, Raw onions can sometimes be an issue. People don't have the same response to cooked onions. But again, once you convert to a plant-based diet, if you don't get all the way better, then you would look at food triggers like raw onions. Um, coffee in some people, uh, decaf coffee doesn't really make much of a difference, which means that it's probably something else in the coffee bean um, that's causing it. Now, to be clear, coffee doesn't cause heartburn in a lot of people. Um, but for people who it does cause reflux, then you got to stop drinking it. Uh, chocolate, tomato and orange juice, alcohol, again, not in everybody, but if you convert to a health-promoting plant-based diet based on the pyramid I showed you yesterday, and the reflux persists, then we're going to take a look at some of these things. High levels of H. pylori, but not as much as you might think. And the eradication of H. pylori brings with it a series of health risks. In other words, if the, pop if the population is too high, we should be reducing it, but the goal seems to be eliminating it. And we've eliminated H. pylori in the uh, guts and stomachs of 94% of people born after 1990. And we know that it's a, it's a factor that contributes to increased risk of things like Crohn's and colitis and reflux. Um, stress definitely uh, has an effect. And then certain prescription drugs. So one of the first things we do when people come into our office is we look at the prescription drugs that they're taking and see if that's what's causing the problem. Okay. Now, it doesn't mean that I'm not going to say something to somebody who's eating a diet based on meat, dairy, and processed foods that they shouldn't change it. But the point is that if the person really works hard to change their diet and continues to take um, you know, Valium, for example, they may find that their reflux doesn't get better and can't get better until they get off that drug. So you always have to look at drug interactions. And, and um, that's, that's why when some of you ask me questions about, you know, this is my condition, what should I do? And I don't mean to sound like I'm incompetent when I say I don't know, but I don't know unless I have all the information what you should do. And I certainly don't want to mislead people by trying to give them simplistic answers to their questions when the issue might be a little bit more complicated. Um, I mentioned that asthma was an issue. Acid that reaches the back of the throat can be inhaled into the bronchial airways and burn them, and in response, the airways constrict, swell, and mucus production increases. We see activation of the mast cells and mucus production increases. It's estimated that 80% of all people with asthma also have reflux. Most children with asthma have reflux. And this is interesting. Reflux drugs will reduce the um, incidence and severity of asthma attacks. Uh, so we know there's a connection. Now, how you deal with this uh, asthma or reflux is not to take drugs, obviously, but um, it confirms the fact that there's a connection. Complications of reflux, ulcers, cancer, erosion of tooth enamel, hoarseness, diminished sense of taste, sinusitis, ear pain, and inflammation. Now, there's a type of reflux that um, we call it silent reflux that you might have heard about. Symptoms are different than GERD, and it's often not diagnosed as a result. It's due to acid reaching the back of the throat or nasal airway, causing intense inflammation. It's more common in infants since they have undeveloped sphincters and they're prone much of the time. The symptoms in infants and children are hoarseness, chronic cough, trouble feeding, spitting up food, delayed weight gain. In adults, the symptoms are things like bitter taste, excessive throat clearing, persistent cough, 
hoarseness, a lump in the throat that can't be swallowed, mucus in the throat, trouble swallowing, and persistent sore throat. The complications of having it include recurrent ear infections, buildup of fluid in the middle ear, scarring of the throat, and cancer. The American Gastroenterological Association recommends against the use of acid suppression therapy, but gastroenterologists prescribe these uh, drugs all the time anyway, if the person doesn't have typical GERD symptoms. The reason is acid suppression doesn't address the other causes, which include pepsin, bile salts, and bacteria. Well, let's talk about peps pepsin for a minute. It's a pancreatic enzyme that digests protein, and it's particularly harmful remains in the laryngeal epithelia after reflux erupts. Um, the action of pepsin is independent of the pH of the fluid reflux. So what would cause your body to have abnormal levels of the enzyme pepsin? Protein loading, okay? So protein is a major cause of uh, excessive protein intake is a major cause of reflux. And then bile salts, what ha why would bile salts, what, what would diet have to do with that? Well, the more fat you eat, more bile your liver has to produce to emulsify it. So this is a diet-induced disease most of the time, including silent reflux. Um, the diagnosis of silent reflux is difficult. 80% of healthy controls have some signs of laryngeal irritation, and the diagnosis is highly subjective. There is no accepted protocol for the most effective treatment of patients with silent reflux. Placebo-controlled clinical trials so no, show no benefit for using proton pump inhibitors, but they're prescribed anyway. So in the absence of that, I think it would be a good idea to look at dietary change. If the other stuff doesn't work, how about we change the diet, right? Again, the reason I spend time on this stuff is to show you clearly that your best option is to pay attention to the way you're living your life instead of paying attention to how many specialists you can go see um, looking for answers to your condition. So medications for GERD and acids, um, those would be like Tums, Rolaids, Maalox. They reduce the amount of acid in the stomach. Then you have H2 receptor antagonists like Tagamet, Zantac, um, pepsid, acid. Histamine stimulates the secretion of gastric acid by acting on these receptors, which are found in the parietal cells of the gastric mucosa. Um, and so the H2 uh, receptor agonists block the action of histamine. Uh, proton pump inhibitors, real popular ones, Prevacid and Prilosec, they reduce gastric acid production. Uh, many antacids contain, contain aluminum, which we know accumulates in the brain and can increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Another thing is that gastric acid is needed to break down and digest food. The problem with, with acid is not usually that your stomach is producing too much. It's really the sphincter is allowing passage of a, even a single drop of acid into the esophageal tube is incredibly painful. Um, to the extent that you do produce too much acid, it's usually in response to, produce, to consuming too much protein. And uh, some meds to treat GERD may actually increase the risk of stomach cancer because you create, create a very unsafe environment when the pH of the stomach gets too high. Um, two of the most popular proton pump inhibitors are Prilosec, OTC, and Prevacid. There's an increased risk of intestinal infections, especially C. diff. Taking the drugs can cause negative changes in the gut microbiome, and that allows the proliferation of C. diff. Um, another condition that results from, hypo, uh, from taking uh, these types of drugs is hypomagnesemia, which usually requires hospitalization. Taking magnesium supplements while taking the PPIs, that's sometimes the holistic pharmacist approach. Uh, it's not a very good idea. It doesn't really help. And there's an increased risk of malignant esophageal cancers due to the reduced stomach acid. Results from pancreatic enzymes that should have been inactivated by the uh, stomach acid, damaging tissues in the esophagus. So normally all that pepsin that would be used to digest protein isn't broken down very well when you're taking a PPI. So you're eating a diet that causes you to have GERD. You take a drug that reduces the production of acid, which makes the profound negative effects of the bad diet you are eating more pronounced. Does everybody understand that? This is, this, this is the downward cycle of give me a symptom, I'll give you a drug, and then you go home and eat, drink, and be merry, and wait till the next bad thing happens. And we have to break that cycle. We just have to break that cycle. People have got to start seeking health instead of sick care treatment. I loved what Dr. Williams said yesterday. 
during the panel when he said he wants to he wants to not be in the sick care business anymore he'd like to be in the health care business i think that's what we all would aspire to do so i just wrote a five page paper on proton pump inhibitors with about 40 references and their side effects just this is just all about the side effects of the drugs and so you can go home and watch my lecture on this on YouTube. It's 15 minutes just on negative effects of PPIs, all right? So the causes of GERD may have been a little bit misunderstood, and I think this is really important too. Instead of resulting from gastric acid burning the mucosa of the esophagus, GERD stimulates the release of inflammatory cytokines from esophageal cells, which attracts more inflammatory cells to the esophagus. It's generalized state of inflammation that people exist in because they carry extra weight, they eat an inflammatory diet, and their immune systems are out of control. Inflammation and subsequent damage to the esophageal tissue may be the cause of heartburn and chest pain. If that's true, our current approach to treating GERD can't help at all. Because if you don't do something about the generalized inflammation, you can't possibly solve the problem. And this goes to, you know, Dr. Campbell talks a lot about holism with a WH. It goes to the importance of looking at the whole person when you're considering how to help a person improve their health. You can't compartmentalize. And that's what's happened a lot in medicine is that we're compartmentalizing. Everybody specializes in a body part. And, um, and so you go from doctor to doctor and nobody's really paying attention to the entire you. And, and where this, where this kind of, you know, the um, light bulb went on in my head, I do a lot of professional mentoring with health professionals to teach them how to look at people's health histories and, and analyze what's been going on and talk to them about their whole health. And I'll never forget, when I first started doing this a few years ago, a doc in my class said, I bet this is the first time, because we make people give us all this information, I bet this is the first time that all of this information has ever been in one place in a sequential order, like what happened to this person so that we could look at how to help the person unravel the story, working backwards to unravel all the stuff that's been done to him over the years. I think that's so important. So we, we're big believers in practicing holism. So once again, if you understand the drugs can't help you and all that stuff, where does that leave us? We're back to diet again, aren't we? Dietary excellence, a wellness form, health style diet, if you wanna uh, resolve this problem naturally, start with a low fat plant-based diet, and then you do elimination of additional foods if necessary. A lot of people get well just by losing weight and adopting a health-promoting diet. If not, you may have to look at specific tr foods that tend to trigger. Some people are fine as long as they don't have alcohol. I had a guy in my office the other day who was suffering from terrible reflux. Even the PPIs weren't making things better. And he said, I got to the place where I was really feeling good and I have one glass of wine and I was miserable. Apparently, I can't have wine. I said, well, that was an interesting experiment and now you know, all right? Other people can have wine, no problem. So a little bit of experimentation sometimes to find those food triggers. Eat smaller meals. We, we have a variety of reasons why we recommend that people eat five or six meals a day. And I just, I'm teaching a course on sports nutrition, which is interesting. And um, one of the things I found is a tremendous amount of research showing that, uh, because the, the timing of food becomes important for athletes, that's why I started looking into this. And there's a ton of research out there showing that body composition is better if you eat frequently throughout the day, um, the uh, amount of calories you burn um, is better, and actually reflux gets better when people eat less food more often. We call it the eat less more often Elmo diet. Uh, it's kind of a good approach to follow. Um, stop consuming water and other liquids with meals. Consume water in between meals. Um, dehydration is a, is a common cause. And in fact, in uh, several studies, just drinking more water has been shown to resolve GERD and it's a better, it comes out better than PPIs in a direct comparison. Uh, constipation is a cause of reflux. And again, you can have that moving experience by eating a high fiber diet and that will no longer be a problem for you. Uh, probiotics are helpful in resolving GERD. Um, and then there are a couple of things, and I, I debated about whether or not to say this from the stage because I don't like to do this because there's so many caveats, but DGL is um, a chewable, you can get it in a chewable form, and uh, it can sometimes help people wean themselves off of uh, PPIs because it, it uh, coats the, esophageal, the, the uh, esophagus and prevents pain. Um, it's contraindicated for some people, so the decision to use this should be made with a health professional. And then slippery elm bark tea is also helpful helpful per, for relieving pain and discomfort during the withdrawal process from PPIs. Mm -hmm.